It was one of those March days when the sun shines hot and the wind blows cold, when it is summer in the light and winter in the shade. Charles Dickens, Great Expectations. And I know you're all expecting the great Karen Hartglass to be speaking to you here on It's All About Food. But I, Gary DiMatte, decided to take the opening statement to heart. Glass. <laughs> and here, an esteemed guests, is Karen Hartglass. Hey, Gary, that was a great opening. Hi, Karen. Welcome to March 1st, it is, 2022. I, do you believe we've made it to March 1st, 2022? I don't believe it, actually. And it's becoming more and more difficult to believe with what's going on in the world. And I know that we could sit here and talk about all of the horrible things that are happening in the world. And we probably will. But first, we're going to try and talk about some good stuff. And one of the things that I thought we would talk about today start it right off, is apple pie. Because when the going gets tough, the tough make apple pie. <laughs> or something sweet and or delicious. Or apple cake. Yeah, Which remember apple cake? I know you've made apple cake on this program <laughs> before. And I know because I was fortunate enough to, to eat be all on those the, samples. <laughs> to be on the other end of sampling all of your different apple cakes. Remind us, why were you making those apple cakes? I know, but maybe our listeners don't. Okay, know. anyway, everybody, welcome to It's All About Food. And yeah, thank you oh, for hi, being everyone. here. We like to talk about food. We're we going to talk about food. Good, wholesome, plant based food. So it was back in the beginning of the pandemic. Do you remember that? I do, and I, and I think it's perfect to talk to start talking about this because now everyone is telling us that the pandemic is now not going so terribly anymore. Of course yet, not. Just in time for just, another tragedy. Just yeah. in time for a war. I don't know how that happened, but okay. So we'll talk about the beginning of the pandemic that's now ending. So go ahead. What can you tell us about that as it affects responsible eating and living and the subject of apples? Right. I like apples. When the pandemic started, we were eating two apples a day. We, we were. We started this practice and we got off it and I'm kind of bringing it back now because I really like eating apples, especially twice a day. Right. We were asked by a wonderful listener if we could modify this family recipe and make it vegan and gluten-free. The with, listener's family recipe. The listener's family recipe. And we made many iterations and it was really fun and they were all good they were just all different mm. and some were sweeter were and not so sweet yeah. but, some had sugar some had less yeah I, I remember that but i think anything made with apples is really nice and apples are particularly cozy when right. when you cook with them when you put them in oatmeal or you put them in a pie <laughs> right a pie is what i'm specifically it's, talking about it's a very comforting food and your apple pie is terrific and i want to reiterate because I haven't said this in a while. If there's a recipe, a family recipe, or a dish that you like and it's not vegan, or maybe it's not as healthy as you like and you would like a better version of it, send it to us and we will do our best to make modifications. Right now I'm working on a black bean quinoa and corn burger. Yeah, delicious. And I made the first pass yesterday. Oh, it's fantastic. He liked it. No, it's a great <laughs> burger. First of all, it looks like a burger. I use, right? okay, now the, the trick is I use small red beans. Now, this is supposed to be a black bean burger, but I, <laughs> I only I had small red these beans. These red beans are really, I think you should keep this. And maybe the, I won't use black beans then, but I, it gives it a great color. Yeah. It does. It gives it, it a burger color. It gives it, it a bloody burger color. Well, it gives it a bean burger color. You know, a lot of bean burgers that I've had in the past. They're not that appetizing looking. Once you eat mm -hmm. them, they're fantastic. But this didn't really look like a bloody burger to me, but it, it didn't look like a bloody burger. <laughs> right. All of a sudden, I've gone English, eh? Right. Bloody burger. You're a bloody burger. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I got a little carried away. He can't help himself. <laughs> but it also didn't look like a traditional bean burger, especially a black bean burger. This had a really, really wonderful appetizing look to it. Good. Well, so, we'll have uh, a few more iterations. We're going to be filling up on these bean quinoa corn burgers for a while until I get it right. Right. But let's go back to your apple pie but, because this is really a good story. Yeah. So then 
after I finished playing with the burgers, I had to finish out the meal and I made an apple pie. Well, you cooked a lot and we were talking about that before going on the air. That could be a way for you to relieve stress. Is I've cook. said this before. Th- cooking for me right. is definitely therapeutic. It's definitely relaxing. I know for some people who are not that comfortable in the kitchen, cooking is stressful. And then again, I know some people who sleep in the kitchen. So that must mean that they're really comfortable, <laughs> especially right after they eat. They just... Who's, oh, oh, Gary. So yeah. if you're comfortable in the kitchen or really comfortable in the kitchen or not so comfortable in the kitchen and you're stressed out, try cooking. Maybe that'll stress you out even more. But for Karen... It works you know, for me. When there's problems going on in the world, Karen gets affected by them, as all of us do. And one of the ways I think that Karen relieves stress in her life and it's- despair is to actually put herself to work and in a silent and zen-like way, you cooked all day. Mm, some of the day after I did the laundry. <laughs> right. So tasks. I did tasks. And doing some of these basic tasks for me is somewhat relaxing. And it puts you in the moment right. of the basic things. And I don't do it with disdain. I enjoy it. And I know that whatever work I'm putting into whatever I'm doing, it's a gift for me and you as well, Gary. I reap the benefits. When everything is finished. The important thing about what you're saying, I think, especially during times like these, would be that you don't complain when you have these tasks in front of you. For example, the laundry. Or if you want an apple pie, you don't go out to the store and buy an apple pie. I make one. You make one. (laughs) And you make it from what some people would consider scratch, making it from scratch. But you really make it from scratch. Because making it from scratch on one level is, you know, I opened the bag of flour that I bought at the store. You make the flour. Now you don't go grow the grains. Well, that would be really scratchy if I grew everything first and then made the pie, but I don't go that far. But you you take the grains and you grind them in in the food mill. Now, the crust that you make, we'll start with that, is a gluten-free crust. So, and you, it's a blend of different grains that you grind into flour and you mix that with a little fat and... I don't know why everybody doesn't do it this way. I got into this a while ago and... I just enjoy it. Well, that's the question. Are we too trusting of things that we buy in the grocery store? For example, are we too trusting of of things like five pound bag of flour, for example? I remember when I was in charge of the theater program at a high school, and it was a single sex high school, all girls. One of the classes they had to take was each of them had to carry around for (laughs) the course of a week or so and be responsible for it was a five pound bag of flour. And they had to treat it like their baby. So they could never be without this five pound bag of flour. And I guess the idea was, and I don't know if it was a week or a month or a year. And if Jeanette, if you're out there listening, did you have to do this? I know one of my (laughs) friends, Jeanette, is also a listener of this program on occasion and a great supporter of us. I met Jeanette when she was uh, attending this school that I'm talking about. Was it a five pound bag of flour that you had to carry around for a week, a month, a year? How long was that? Did you have to have birthday parties for it? Fill me in here. Anyway, so that's what I think about whenever I think about going to the grocery store and buying a five-pound bag of flour, which has been a long, long time. But the other thing I want to bring up about this flour, and I know I'm getting off course here, but not really, I'll come back, is that the one comment that I used to hear from girls who would come to rehearsal with their five-pound bag of flour (laughs) was that this five-pound bag of flour gets very heavy. Yeah. Very heavy. And very heavy, very quickly. Very quickly. Mm. And, you know, during rehearsal, they had to watch their five-pound bag of flour, make sure it wasn't turning to bowl weevils or... Yeah. When you buy flour in a store, you don't know what's been ground with the grain. There were, you know, a handful of cockroaches or not. I, I, I know some foods have a certain limit to how much bug <laughs> can, can be, be in the food, like chocolate has a limit to how much cockroach you can have right and i don't know how they figure those things out but there is a certain amount of impurity that is allowed in foods with flowers you don't know when they were ground where they've been what they've been through and i personally like to simplify the process start with the simplest 
ingredients, meaning ingredients that are as close to coming out of the ground as you can get. Right. And it's very, it was very popular getting back to the beginning of the pandemic to make bread. Right. Bread was very popular. And we, you and I have personal experience with this. We were going on websites to try to find some flour and they were selling out of all of these flours. So then the next step for us was to look for the the kernels of That's right. I forgot that. That we could grind ourselves. Is that how I got started on this? Because it was hard to find flour? No, you were grinding your own... um, Before. Oatmeal and You were looking for einkorn flour. I was looking for the organic einkorn wheat. Yes. And it was very difficult to find because unlike you, I'm not necessarily that concerned with, I mean, I'm concerned about it, especially for people who are, have celiac disease, can't tolerate wheat. But I occasionally like wheat, but I like pure wheat. I don't want to, as you mentioned just now, cockroaches in my wheat. Or <laughs> I want to know what's in the wheat. And still, there's, there's this einkorn flour out there that's supposed to be pretty clean. But, you know, grinding it yourself, you can be sure that the organic einkorn is as clean as can be. Well, what's nice about einkorn, in addition to being organic, is it is an ancient grain or a grain that has not been hybridized like most wheat varieties are today, that most things made from wheat are made from today. In getting back to your pie crust, you grind all of your own grain. Yeah. And Oats, so what were some millet, of the grains that you used? Oats and millet. And garbanzo. Garbanzo beans. Those are really yeah. loud when you grind them up. It is. And I've confessed that I use flour for that. Although sometimes I've ground the beans. Thank you. We're all thankful here at the apartment. <laughs> <You're> right. <complex. laughs> so you first grind up your blend and your blend changes periodically, right? Depending on whatever you have in the fridge. Kind so, of. So my objective is to is to not let is to let people know that don't be afraid of this mix of gluten free grains because a lot of them work the same way. Like if you're if you don't have rice, for example, you want to make a rice flour crust. Millet works fine. You know what's funny though, Gary? I came to this place after taking this long circuitous path right. where I, I was reading blogs and, and combining starches with grains and trying to find the right percentage mix. I don't know what happened, but I feel like I freed myself. <laughs> I'm just using whole grains. I kind of changed the mix occasionally, but it all works. It all works great. Well, the other thing that I I must say that happened in my favor was that the day started, speaking of grains, with gluten-free pancakes. Yeah. Well, when you asked for them, they appear. They were phenomenal. And again, you started with... The mix, oats, millet, and garbanzo bean flour. And those were phenomenal. With some blueberries in them. Blueberry Mm -hmm. pancakes. Those tasted... As close as I can, as close as anyone can get to a pancake made with wheat. It really did. It was amazing. Well, what really helps, and we've really experienced this because when we travel, we don't have all of our ingredients and we don't have all of our equipment and it makes things more difficult. Right. When we're at home and we've got everything, it makes things easier and faster. So while I'm making the pancakes, I took a little aquafaba bean water that was frozen in the freezer and let it warm up and i put it in the you didn't put it in the microwave the k5 i put it in the k5 to warm it up how did you warm it up the stand mixer i just put it in a warm so you froze the aquafaba in a glass jar yeah so what happens is i don't want the glass jar to break while i'm warming it up so first i pour some cold water on it and then i let it change to warm and then i let it sit in a bowl of hot water a bain marie. Right? You put it in a, but you don't put that bain marie on the stove. Oh, no. Just in the sink. I don't want it to get too hot. It, it defrosts pretty quickly. Because we don't have a microwave. So I was, I was bringing that I up see, to let yeah. everybody know that. And I find that the aquafaba really whips up well when it's cold. You know, isn't that strange? Because that's just like egg whites. Yeah. They whip up really well when the bowl is it's cold. It's cold. Or, or whipping cream. Right. So I make my... Pancake batter, and then the I fold in the aquafaba, and then I put it right on the grill. It's really fun. So you made pancakes. <laughs> I made pancakes. So that's how the day started. You made pancakes from scratch. Exactly. I mean, really from scratch. And that's getting back to my original comment, which uh, was that you do everything from scratch in a zen-like way. Your scratch version is really extreme because, or some people would think it would be extreme because normally when you make something from scratch, 
You buy the products from the store, like the flour or what have you. No, you buy a box of Bisquick. It has everything in it, I and you just add bis- what milk or water or water for biscuits. Just add water and a fork, and it's all mixed together. Yeah, down. I haven't They're had called... that in a long time. I know drop biscuits used to be my a really fun thing for me to make when I was a kid. I feel like we're living on a very strange planet. Yeah, I say this all the time. This is a strange planet. Now, to my knowledge, I don't know of any other planets. <laughs> so I'm calling it strange, but I don't know. I have nothing to compare it to. And yet, day in and day out, I am constantly shocked, depressed, scared, disappointed, frustrated with the choices my fellow humans make. Right. Some of them. And I read the newspaper in the morning. I usually wake up and I have a little rhythm. And one of them is to read the headlines. Sure. <laughs> I don't turn on the news, but I read the newspapers. You do. And I read a variety of them. New yes, York you do. Times, sometimes BBC. Sometimes I go over and I read French papers or Spanish papers. And I kind of get a feeling for what's going on. And of course, we know now there's this horrible war in Ukraine and unprovoked, of course, and Russia just has come along and decided to be a big bully, a big bully and push around the Ukraine. And many, many people are disturbed about this, as we should be. This is a horrible thing. But there are horrible things going on day in and day out all over on this planet. Yes. As there are wonderful things that go on day in and day out. There's horrible things going on day in and day out in this apartment building. (laughs) I mean, everywhere there's horrible things going on, right? That's right. And then in addition, while our hearts, our thoughts and prayers are going out to people that are affected by horrible wars, then there were the animals. 60, 70 billion land animals. I don't even know what the number is anymore. It's just something I can't even think of. But we knowingly and willingly torture these animals every day so that people will have certain kind of things they like to eat. Right. Flesh and milk and egg. So when I'm but trying to figure what, out... Wh- how do we deal with it? Exactly. How when do we there's deal with so it? much denial. I was teaching a class today. I was teaching a writing class and the exercise was to write a film review. And so this intelligent young man wrote a film review on the movie Don't Look Up. His key word in his thesis statement was... Something that you and I were talking about before I went into class, and that was denial. Denial. Denial is not just a river in Egypt. So we deny the fact that we are in this climate crisis. In this movie, they were using the, the climate crisis. They were using a meteor hurtling towards Earth as the metaphor for the climate crisis. I won't go on any further. I don't want to give you any spoiler alerts. Yeah, I won't review the film. But anyway, it was weird that you and I were talking about denial before coming on the air, Mm. And that in my class, this young man was talking about denial in his report, in his thesis statement. So there's all of these folks out there that are in denial about what it is that they're eating and how it gets on their plates. This is nothing new, folks. We talk about this all the time. We talk about how there's these, these defense mechanisms that are built into the human condition that allow us to tune things out that are unpleasant to think about. There are people that we know who stop us right away and say, I don't really want to talk about that movie that you've just watched, whatever it is. And there have been dozens of these movies coming out. Cowspiracy, Seaspiracy, Game Changers, all of this. When you tell people, look, this really does it in a very wonderful, soft way. They they cut you off right away and they say, "I I don't want to know how my food gets on my plate. I don't care. We're up against all of those things. So we get angry. We come on this program. We talk, we talk, we talk, we talk. We never (laughs) stop talking about it. But what we're talking about today is how does one deal with these things that are going on in this crazy mixed up planet that you're talking about? Yeah. So it's not just how do we deal with the horrors of animal agriculture, but how do we deal with the horrors of war, the horrors of human agriculture? You know, there are horrors in that. Let's talk about human agriculture for a minute. The pesticides, the herbicides, the things that we, we spray on plants. 
We always talk about in the, on this program that we buy organic. A lot of people turn their nose up to organic and say, oh, well, I don't buy organic. As if it was a bad thing to not want to have exactly. pesticides and herbicides. And one thing I want to say with regard to that is one reason why we eat organic, in addition to it's better for our health, there are people That's right. that are negatively impacted. The people who work on the farms that have to harvest or till or whatever, and they're exposed to all of these chemicals. Now, sometimes they wear hazmat yeah, garb, sure. and sometimes they don't. The and it could simply be their shoes walking back into their home and bringing these contaminants to their family because there's a tremendously high birth defect rate with people exposed to these pesticides and herbicides from farming. a lot of people farming. think that's because they leach into the water. There are so many, so I many mean, reasons. I know you, and I know you. if I came home from the fields and I had been working in pesticides <laughs> and herbicides, you would make me strip down outside before coming in, and then you would take a hose and hose me down, and then you would say, sleep outside. So, <laughs> and I would give you a big dose of vitamin C. Right. But anyway, it makes you angry, right? And I open this with a quote by Dickens, I'm going to continue with another quote by Maya Angelou. If you're not angry, you're either a stone or you're too sick to be angry. <laughs> you should be angry. You must not be bitter. Bitterness is like cancer. It eats up the host. It doesn't do anything to the object of its displeasure. So use that anger. Yes. You write, you paint, you dance, you march, you vote. You do everything about it. You talk it. Never stop talking. And I would add to that, you cook. And that's, that's right. what you do. And that's what I do. Right? That's my relief. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a long way around the opening of the show to get here. <laughs> but what do we do for the anger? As Maya Angelou said so brilliantly, yes, use that anger. And sometimes you're channeling that anger into cooking. And then the anger goes away because what you're creating, you know, is not only good for you, it's good for the planet, it's good for the animals, but it's really good for the spirit, for the soul, if you believe in a soul. But you have to believe in something other than, than what there is to look at. Some people believe in God, some people believe in the universe, some people believe in the spirit, some people believe in the energy that's just flying around between all of us, that it connects us. Right? Whatever woo-woo, wah-wah, hocus-pocusy thing you believe in, it does happen. It is out there. It does exist. And so you're channeling this into the cooking. And whatever you do, it comes out beautifully. Even the mistakes are good. There are no mistakes. Only learning experiences. That's right. So we started with pancakes. The and then after the pancakes... You... I made the burgers and then I made the apple pie. We I was cooking burgers. all day. So it was kind of a diner day. You know what happened, actually? I woke up in the morning and I thought it was Monday. And I'm racing because I have all these things to do. And I'm feeling like I'm not going to have enough time. And then I learned it was Sunday. And at that point, I thought, I'm doing whatever I want because I, I didn't even think I had this day. It was yeah. free. You started with laundry. <laughs> you made pancakes. You, you know, you, yeah, it was anything but a day off. Well, for, from my point of view, there are some things that I consider work and some things that I don't see as work. I just see it as things we do. That's right. And that was wonderful. And then you made the pie. Let's talk about this pie for a second because we brought it up. We have to talk about it. It's good. You don't use any sugar in this There's pie. There's no sugar in it. I am amazed because it was so sweet. I have made different variations of this pie. It's on our website, Responsible Eating and Living. It's called Tarte au Pum. It's right. French. How and do you spell that in case anybody wants to find it? T-A-R-T-E, Tarte. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Space, A-U-X-O, mm -hmm. space, pum, P-O-M-M-E-S. The French have a lot of letters at the ends of words that are not pronounced. <laughs> you have version one, and you have version two, and you have an, a, a classic French tarte au pain. Oh, it's the classic. Now, that has sugar in it if you want to add sugar, but you don't have to. And then I made another version recently where I didn't use sugar. I used dates. And the one that I made, right. I didn't add any extra sweet anything. And 
It was fine. It was terrific. It just has a nice deliciousness about it. And I like to layer the apples in a very pretty way, so it's beautifully presented. It, yeah, the pictures are beautiful on the website. Okay, and then I had gone to Whole Foods the other day. A rare thing. I don't usually go to Whole Foods. But you were visiting your mom. And it was on the way home, and I was able to pick up a treat for Gary. Now, this is the real, honest-to-goodness treat for our household. Yes, this is the treat. I mean, a lot of people have go-to treats where they can get them all the time. They go to the store. They always have them. None of the stores in this area have this particular treat. Once in a while, we get Nada Moo. Nada Moo. It's organic. It's vegan ice cream, and it's the best. Yeah, so during all of this zaniness that's going on in the world, we sat and had several discussions about it, but we also had pie. Yeah, and you were just telling me a story about a woman in the Ukraine. Yeah, it was right when the tanks were about to roll in and start blowing things up. Uh, she didn't want to be alone, so she walked to her friend's house. She posted this on social media. And it's being shared now, so I'm sure you've all seen this too. Called her friend and said, you know, I don't want to be alone. And her friend was alone. She said, well, come over. So she walked to her friend's house with her suitcase packed. She stopped at the store, the grocery store, picked up a cake, brought it to her friends. They had tea and cake. And then together they walked to the subway stations, which is where all of the people were, were going to because the subway station was like a bomb shelter. So they had their cake and they had their conversation, they had their tea and they then together walked with their suitcases to the subway station. And the next shot was of all of them in the subway station. There was hundreds and hundreds of people sitting down on the floor of the subway mm. station because they were being their, t their city was being attacked. But cake was involved, is what I'm saying. Yes, and that's the beautiful part where at different moments... We can sit and have a sweet treat, a cake, a pie, and tea. And I, I just love that image. In that particular moment, if you do need to think about this, there was nothing going on for them in that particular moment, so they were living in the moment. And it was good in that moment. In that moment, everything was right. And so that's, a, that's another way to deal with the despair. Because the sickness in all of us is the sickness of the spirit. Whatever you call your spirit, your soul, whatever, if that's sick, that's also called despair. We can't despair. We have to do <laughs> things that lift our spirit. Because once we experience spiritlessness, it affects our mental and physical being. Mm. It really does. Mm -hmm. Mental sickness adds to the physical oh, sickness. Oh, absolutely. Stress. Environment. In, right? yes. We talk to people all the time. And the first thing you ask them is, has anything changed in your environment? And you mean their, their actual environment. Like, is something going on at home? Is something happening to you at home? For me, I go into the kitchen, I cook, or I make a pot of tea. Right. And people will talk about having a caffeinated beverage, for example, as energizing them. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not a coffee drinker. And most of the tea that we drink nowadays at home has no caffeine. But it's just this ritual of boiling the water, taking an ice pot, putting whatever it is I'm going to call tea <laughs> into mm -hmm. the pot, taking a nice cup, and sitting and enjoying... The simplicity and the beauty of that and and the the drink is comforting because it's warm and cozy. I've been drinking a number of different brews. Yeah, let's talk I just want to share. You haven't been sharing them with me because you have different tastes than I do. Well, I, I usually love to drink the things that you drink. However, now you've gone off into some strange <laughs> land. I mean, I don't even know what you're drinking now. Sometimes I see it, it's green. It looks like <laughs> pond scum. I'm, I'm saying Karen went to the pond. She went to the pond and drew some green mossy water and is now drinking it. Yeah. Well, last week I talked about the turmeric ginger lattes. And those are really great. And I make up my own, just like all the recipes. I never make it the same, but I made one with ginger powder and turmeric powder and this time i added a little cinnamon and ginger powder a pumpkin spice right and sprinkled some of delicious, that delicious by the way delicious. and that's really good but thick, I very thick <laughs> it's kind of like not necessarily tea it's more or less a shake 
But well, it depends on how much it's you like add. a warm shake. Yeah, I backed <laughs> off today when I made a second round. It wasn't as thick. <laughs> and remember, don't forget the spoon to stir it up. Yeah, and don't forget drink. the test is if it stands up to the spoon, you know you need to add a little hot water. It doesn't do that. <laughs> Then another thing I'm really into, now this is a drink that does have caffeine in it, but this is my new hot chocolate. Right. It's my new version of hot chocolate. And what am I using? I found this particular brand, and I'm sure there are other brands, and uh, once again, we don't get anything by promoting brands, but this is Navitas Organics, and they have an organic cacao powder. Cacao powder. It's cacao powder. You use it just like cocoa. The difference is it's not alkalized ah and i think that's why i can drink it without any sweetener it's not bitter at all and it's just chocolate yumminess without the sweetness which is how chocolate was first used right you do you brew it like it it was like it's an instant coffee yeah it's powder and i add hot water yeah basically boom that's it Basically, boom. I might add a little soy milk to it. Maybe some date paste. The last few days, I've been sprinkling some pumpkin spice in it, which is really amazing. Why? Because I've had different chocolate desserts from time to time that have cinnamon in them. And I always think I'm not in the mood for this. I don't normally like chocolate with cinnamon, but I do in this drink. Wow. And the cinnamon is almost what offers a little suggestion of sweetness without even being sweet. So this is like a, my coffee. Yeah. So see, you're constantly experimenting in the kitchen. You're constantly experimenting. And what does that remind me of? That reminds me of like when a child explores mm. and and a parent allows them to do that. So why do we lose that? When, you haven't lost it. You still have it. Parents let their children explore and, you know, continue exploring. And some, then, some parents do. Some parents, And right. in some cultures they do and then some don't. Well, some some cultures allow their children to explore the world and develop their own powers, etc. And it gives them self-confidence, right? Mm. In the face of experience, they they gain self-confidence and they make mistakes. And, you know, whether it's painting or here, help me cook something or what have you. And so if someone isn't that confident about going in the kitchen, maybe they should think back to when they were children. And they had this fearlessness to try and experiment with things. And I think that's kind of where you're going all the time with this is that Mm. it's you're okay with making mistakes. You're okay with going in the kitchen and experimenting and testing things out. You uh, haven't lost that childlike quality. It's fun. It's like the playroom. Which I think we all need to get (laughs) back to if we're afraid. Because you had mentioned something about a lot of folks are afraid of their kitchens. We need to go back to that fearlessness that we had when we were building our confidence by exploring and learning the world and also getting experience. You can do that in the kitchen. Like, you know, banging pots and pans around and making tea and coming up with new brews of tea. Tea brews. Where'd you get that brews? That's a tea brews brews. So yeah, there's been a lot of other brews that you've done. There was this other brew that you made a while ago you haven't made it in a while where you took a bulb of ginger and you put it on a box grater yeah just ginger tea is good or ginger and lemon is good that's what it was but when i don't have fresh ginger what do you use use powder yeah or we have two kinds of dried ginger we have ginger powder and then we have these granules but they're just pieces only small pieces not powder dehydrated ginger yeah it's very small pieces and i love that you took whole dates and you put those in the tea basket. Oh, sure. Why not? And brewed them. And then they became <laughs> stewed dates. Yeah. It looked really disgusting, but, but it was good, good, right? Yeah, it tea. sweetens the tea. And then when the tea is done, you have a little sweet dessert. Right. A stewed date. So get in the kitchen and experiment like a child. There's no right way to do anything. I make these things up and yeah. you roll your eyes at me when I do. <laughs> I never roll my eyes. That, that would be contemptuous of me. I'm not feeling anything especially contempt for how wonderful it is to watch you play in the zone kitchen. out in the kitchen, yeah. especially when there's horrible things going on in the world. Yes. So what are you doing dealing with horrible things in the world? Oh, yeah. Well, for me to deal with all of this, you have to go internally into yourself and figure out why these things are making us feel the way we're feeling. Despair, 
anxious, angry, read the poets. How do we keep our heart from turning to stone? Basically, the question that I've been asking myself. We do things to strengthen our muscles. We work out, we do yoga, but how do we make our hearts grow stronger? Not in a heart disease sense, but in emotional. How, how do we keep from turning to stone, basically, is what Maya Angelou said. Keep our resilient little muscle from turning into a hard rock. And so what I've been doing to shake the blues away <laughs> is I've been trying to understand what complaining is all about. Because a lot of us, you catch yourself complaining, especially when there's a lot of craziness going on in the world. And you catch yourself thinking about horrible things, about situations that you find yourself in or you find the world in that are very difficult to deal with. What other people say. Again, we talk about your surroundings, your life the situations that are going on that you have to be aware of how it's affecting you. I opened the show with a quote. I'll add another quote by Eckhart Tolle. And I know it, there's all of these spiritual guides out there that people go to. I've never been one to rely on one person only. I read everybody. What Tolle says is, see if you can catch yourself complaining in either speech or thought about a situation you find yourself in. What other people do or say, your surroundings, your life situation, even the weather. To complain is always non-acceptance of what is. It invariably carries an unconscious negative charge. When you complain, you make yourself into the victim. When you speak out, you are in your power. So change the situation by taking action or by speaking out if necessary or possible. Leave the situation or accept it. All else is madness. And so what I think we're trying to do on this program is to speak out and to give solutions, not just add to the noise of complaining. And so that's what I try to do is I try to make sense of it in that way. And, you know, Eckhart Tolle, he was discovered by Oprah. Remember? Yes, I don't we knew about him before Oprah. There are lots of other people that you can read. And of course, you can go back to the source of all of this, which to me, I think is, is Zen Buddhism. And I'm by no means a Buddhist, or I'm really not a person that, that is, would be considered Zen-like because I, you know, I react, I'm passionate, and I, I let it out. But what I like to do is I like to speak out. I like to, to change the situation by changing action. I think taking action like Cooking, for example, is taking action. It's saying, I'm not going to sit here in misery. I'm going to actually do something constructive. Going it's to... taking control right. of your own life because these horrible things go on and you think, there's nothing I can do. I have no control over that. And to a large extent, we don't have control. There may be a few people who can go into a war zone or affect governments to make change. But for most of us, there's not a whole lot that we can do to solve a big problem far away. And many people are glued to the television because they, you know, they have to know what's going on. Or they think they have to know what's going they on. They think they have to know what's going on. But That's what key. The, what they're really closing their eyes to is what is, is what really is going on around them. And again, we come back to that. I don't want to know how my food gets on my plate. I don't want to know about the exploitation of animals. I don't want to know about how we're putting human beings in harm's way by having them go out in the fields and pick produce that has been contaminated with toxic chemicals and then they're bringing them home to their families and their families are getting sick we just want to make sure that it's there and so what we're talking about and i'm saying that ironically of course yeah. i'm saying that sarcastically but we will turn on the news and we will watch it for 24 hours a day and we will get wrapped up in that and that's something that entertains us yeah so i don't understand the disconnect between one and yet the connect with the other i say get the violence out of your own life. Yes. Get the violence out of your own life. You see this on television, this violence, this exploitation, this war, this abuse, this bullying, and you know it's wrong and you know it's horrible and you can't do anything about it. But what can you do? You can get the violence out of your own life and we all support violence. Right. To some extent, exactly. we don't want to know about it. But it could be the clothing, the shoes, 
the products you buy, and certainly the food on your plate. Yeah, and a lot of reasons I think people put the TV on and they watch these news programs and they surf around is because it's entertainment. They make the news entertaining. Even though it's disgusting and horrible and vile, you keep coming back to it because you can always turn it off, Mm -hmm. right? Just like you can turn off really knowing what the truth is about what gets on your plate. You know, there's another quote I have to, like, if I'm going to be quotey today, I've got to quote another quote. And that is one that I find very funny. And it's, maybe they have nothing else to do in America but to talk about me. (laughs) Guess who said that? (laughs) Putin. Vladimir Putin. Oh, God. And that's it. He's obviously a very interesting person, not in a positive way, but a negative way. And so folks can't understand the bullying that's going on by one man. Yes, but why do we continue to talk about it over and over and over and And the sad thing is... And not take action and complain about it. Our our entertainment on Netflix and Prime and HBO Max and Hulu and all these places, so many of the movies and series are violent and are about conflict, violent conflict. And, And so that's entertainment and we turn that off and then we turn the news on and it's more of the same it's it, maybe it's even hard to differentiate the difference now yeah i think you're right to answer your question about what i'm doing is i'm trying to understand subjectively what's going on in the world and i'm trying to be objective about the way i feel about what's happening i try to keep subjective about what's happening in the world and objective about myself and that's tough to do Being subjective about the world around you, that's a really interesting concept. So when we think about sharing our feeling, let's take veganism, for example, sharing our feeling about being vegan. And for many vegans, it's hard not to show anger. There are a lot of angry vegans and they can do things that are really offensive and rude. And I'm, I'm not proud of those people. But I can understand where they're coming from. But the problem is when you take that approach, the people that you're trying to communicate to are not opening up to you. They turn away. Right. And these people that we want to educate and inform, there are good things about them. But there are also things that they support, either knowingly or not, that aren't good. And how how do we accept them in our lives? And how do we embrace them? And how do we socialize? We're subjective. Right. We cannot look at everything in a black and white way. No. There's so much gray in the middle. You have to look at things subjectively in the world based on your personal feelings, your tastes, your opinions. I mean, take the word subjective, look at it, and try to apply it to what's happening in the world. There's an, a blog post I just read that Marion Nessel posted. She has a blog called Food Politics. I've had her on this program numerous times. Yes, you have. Sure, Marian. And she is very knowledgeable about food and politics and industrial food, food that's created and sold commercially. She's constantly giving you her opinion on a variety of research studies letting you know if the people were objective in the study or if they were doing tests that would support their particular company. But there was a very interesting blog post where she shared a letter she got recently from an attorney who represents a lot of dairy farmers in upstate New York. And this attorney was complaining, complaining (laughs) about what's going on with dairy farmers. And the small dairy farmers, not the ones in giant agribusiness, not the ones that are controlled by giant corporations, but the small farmers, they're really struggling. They have huge debt, and many of them are committing suicide. I mean, we hear stories all over the world about farmers who commit suicide because they are forced to take on tremendous debt and they can't pay. And a lot of this has to do with this crazy imbalance between giant corporations controlling our food and small farmers. It's happening everywhere. Yeah. But here so in New now York, you're talking about it's happening with dairy farmers. Uh, yes. And this attorney is representing them in a variety of ways. And she was frustrated because now we have a mayor in New York City who is vegan or near vegan. And he is anti-dairy and he realizes how bad it is, especially for children. And 
and she's not seeing this as a positive thing, putting these passionate, well-meaning dairy farmers who have been working through the generations and now they're losing their livelihood. Now, my perspective is you've been exploiting cows for a long time. This isn't right. But I also acknowledge that these are people. They've been working hard and it's a difficult struggle. What I would like to see, my ideal world, Karen's world, is the government comes in and says, we don't want you producing dairy anymore. What we're going to do is we're going to help you. We're going to help you transition to some other kind of farming, organic farming, growing some niche products. So then what you're doing is you're looking at this situation right now objectively and see what when you asked me is what am I doing? I'm trying to look at things. But I think it is subjectively. More subjective. Because if I was being objective. Well, you're, you are being very kind and you're saying um, you're, you're, you're not using your personal feelings here. You're considering what the facts are in front of you. You're considering both sides. Mm. You're being objective. I guess I'm being objective. Yeah, and that's great. And, and what I'm trying to do is, and it's kind of a little bit strange, it's more Kierkegaardian, I guess is I'm trying to be more subjective about what's going on in the the world. I mean, subjective about what's going well, on. Well, how in the do world. you do that? My personal feelings now are starting I'm starting to explore with with those a little more. So like, for example, in this case, you're giving me what's happening with the farmer, the the dairy farmers, and so objectively I'd say you're right. We need to look at both sides. We need to consider the dairy farmer and the fact that, you know, these people are trying to raise families and do these things by, you know, the work that they do, which is to exploit cows and take their milk and take their babies and do all of these things. But my personal feelings, my subjective feelings is I'm trying to get to my truth to answer your question. And my truth is I don't believe in that anymore. I could relate to it before because I used to drink milk. and But now the veil has been lifted. I'm no longer in denial about how my milk gets into the grocery store or how milk gets into the grocery store. I'm no longer in denial about any of those things anymore. So now I see this and I hear this story and right away I say, oh, like you, I start to think objectively. And then I think, well, wait a minute, I need to find my own truth. And my own truth is that I don't believe in this. My personal feelings are that this is wrong. And I'm sorry that the dairy farmers are committing suicide. I really am. I, I don't feel anyone should commit suicide, especially if they lose their job. Mm-hmm. Because there's a lot of people out there losing their jobs. But they're not committing suicide. They're going out and finding another job. So if it's, if it's working, if people are realizing milk is bad for you, it's creating all kinds of diseases and things, we don't want to drink it anymore, is that a bad thing? Sure, it's affecting the dairy farmers, but I mean, is it a bad thing that it's we finally find, thing. find out that it's not only ruining the environment, it's also ruining people's health, and it's also not good for the animals? So, yeah, so subjectively, I would say this is a good thing. Now, some people would look at me and say, you're, you know, you're an asshole for saying that, or, but what I'm trying to do on a personal level is look at things subjectively. And, Look at myself, which is the important part of this equation, objectively. So I think I should be more objective about myself. You have to be objective about who you are. If okay, you're going well, to... Ins- this is not you- an easy task. No, is it? this is a very difficult task. So you asked me what I'm doing. Yes. And that's basically what I'm doing. I'm trying to get more into a, I guess, a Zen-like state and take action when things are bothering me that are unjust in the world. We find truth that way. I think we all need to find truth. And I think it's found through subjectivity, through our individual unique apprehension of things. Mm. We do not find truth, and this is another quote, we do not find truth through a detached objectivity, but through a deep engagement with the world. The task is precisely to be objective toward oneself and subjective toward all others. Now, this philosophy is based on Soren Kierkegaard. And so I'm sure you philosophy majors out there know what I'm getting at. So that's the work that I'm trying to do because I think taking action is important, not complaining. And I'm trying not to complain anymore. 
to make that very simple. I I appreciate that tremendously. Because complaining only makes me a victim. It puts me in the place of the victim. It doesn't feel good. And there are many victims out there. Right now, we're seeing that these folks that live in the Ukraine, they are victims. They are truly victims. There is a giant bully with nuclear weapons armed rolling into their city and changing their lives. Those are the people that are victims. There's nothing that those innocent people can do. That woman sitting in the subway, using the subway as a bomb shelter, um, you know, that and all of her friends and all of her neighbors should not have to be that, do that. They are all victims. I'm not a victim. And I guess you can look at this objectively if you want. You could look at this horrible situation objectively, but I can't look at that situation in Ukraine objectively. I have to put my personal feelings into it. I have to say, this is wrong. This is bad. I can't see both sides of this. You know, I have to I have to take a side and the side is my side. That's what I'm trying to do, Karen. Thanks for asking. I'm very impressed. That's I'm what, very proud of you. That's what I've been up to. Thank you. This This wasn't me preaching or being preachy. This was just me answering your question, which is, that's what I'm up to. I'm trying not to complain anymore. I know that's a big job because a lot of us do nothing but complain. We're taking action. You're cooking, and that's a great thing. It's taking control of the situation. That's right. all I can say because you cannot control anyone but yourself. So if you are not happy with the situation, what can you do to change it for you? Exactly. You cannot stop a war in another country, but in your own life, you can experience joy. You can make positive change for people around you. You can do wonderful things that help the world, help society in your life. You and you can take up. action. You can take action. And a lot of people in the Ukraine are taking action. They're trying to do everything in their power to protect their home. And I can't look away from that. And I at the same time, we need to be taking action politically in our country so that something like what's happening there doesn't happen here because we were very close a few years ago oh, we're still having an autocrat take over and change and you see what life. happens when when that when that happens like Eckhart Tolle says you change the situation by taking action or by speaking out if necessary or possible leave the situation or accept it all else is madness that's where we're at now is we're we're now having to really find our truths and if i see a dairy farmer i'm not going to be objective about my feelings i'm not going to say i can't stop feeling the way i feel cuz i have that would be lying to myself mm. i need to see that you know hey you need to you don't commit suicide buddy but change grow yeah. raspberries or get another job and i yeah. know that that's a horrible thing it's like I used to look at all of these these family-owned delis, for example. I'm of Italian ancestry, right? I mean, my ancestors came over here from Italy. You know, every time I used to walk into a deli, I would just feel like, wow, I'm home and this is great. Until I realized what it is, what's that, that stuff that's hanging up there in the deli? And, and so you see all these family-owned businesses and these delis that I, I really used to just adore. But now I walk into them and I think, don't they realize that they're making things that are that animals had to die to make. And, and so I changed my whole... And so I can't go in there and be objective anymore. I can't think, okay, this is a really cool place because it's feeding this family. And, you know, they've been here for generations and they're, you know, hanging up the pig's feet and all of that <laughs> stuff, the pickled pig's feet. I can't look at that anymore and think this... It just... It, I won't allow myself. This is a beautiful thing because it's not. It's not a beautiful... Now, I don't want that family to go out of business, but... I want to go into that deli and say, why don't you do all of this, but do it vegan? You know, don't put egg in your pasta. You can hang sausages, but, you know, hang sausages that are beyond meat sausages. Yeah, you know. it's it's happening. You're just going to have to start that deli, Gary. You know, there's a lot of people doing that now. There's a lot of people here in New York. There's people all over the country, all over the world doing that. They're making gelato without dairy they're doing all kinds of things and so i'm th i'm i'm thinking these dairy farmers i know a lot of stories about dairy farmers too that are that are changing because they realize the veil was lifted too and they're saying i don't want to do this anymore but i do want to make oat milk 
Exactly. Or I, I, tr- I want to turn my dairy farm into an oat growing farm and I want to make oat The milk. smart dairy farmers are doing that. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of folks that are realizing too that, yes, I can feel sad for the dairy farmers that are committing suicide. I don't want anybody to commit suicide, nor do I want anybody be, to be that, that filled with despair that they have to. Call me up. I'll talk to you. I'll give you ways to do it. I was the biggest meat eater, milk drinker, Diet Coke drinker on the planet. And I never, ever thought I could change. And I did. And you did beautifully. Gary, we're at the end of the hour. Mm, So can we summarize a bit? I recommend get the violence out of your own life. Take control of your life. That's the only life you can control. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Just make sure that you eat plenty of pie. And pie, apple pie. Get our recipe at responsibleeatingandliving.com and make some apple pie. Because remember, one another quote here. One must eat to live and not live to eat. That was Moliere. Mm. Now, I know your favorite doctor has that. Eat to live. Eat to live in, in a title, but I think he might have been influenced by Moliere. Uh, and if peut-être, not, je ne sais pas. Right. But anyway, Karen, this was great babbling with you for an hour. Once again. Yes, everybody, you can find us at responsibleeatingandliving.com. Send us emails at info at realmeals.org. And have a delicious week.